So I'm going to speak, as, as, uh, as Helen mentioned, about uh, civil justice. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about criminal justice, but uh, civil justice and, and whether there's equal justice for all in, in the United States or whether it's just for some. And uh, so when we think about um, criminal cases, we know that if you're charged with a crime or the possibility of going to jail and you can't afford a lawyer, you have a right to appoint a lawyer, right? You know that in a number of situations. It's part of the Miranda rights. It's part of the Sixth Amendment to the Constitution, which specifically provides for in criminal prosecutions, criminal matters, it's a series of rights that a criminal defendant has. And the last one is to have assistance of counsel for his, says he is, his uh, um, defense. And so we have a um, constitutional provision that says if you're charged with a crime, you have a right to a counsel for the defense. It doesn't say in the Sixth Amendment you get, uh, if you can't afford a lawyer, you get a free lawyer or a appointed lawyer. But the U.S. Supreme Court, in the case of, of Gideon versus Wainwright, many of us know that, uh, has uh, said that if you have the possibility on, uh, after criminal charges are brought of, of having to go, uh, go to jail, then you have a right uh, to an appointed counsel if you cannot afford one. So we, we have some pretty solid foundation for the right of someone who doesn't have money to get a lawyer to help him or her when they've been charged with a criminal offense that could result in jail time. It's, you know, it's in the Sixth Amendment, the U.S. Supreme Court has talked that getting the case was in the 50, 1950s. So it's, it's a series of cases after that as well. And so how have we implemented that throughout our country? We have a series of, of uh, public defender offices some of them, most of these are funded by counties or states. Generally, they're not funded by the federal government. They're funded by counties and states. They take on that responsibility. Uh, and the uh, federal government does fund some federal public defenders for those that are charged with federal crimes. So there's some federal public defender offices around, and there are uh, uh, public defender offices, for example, in Hawaii, which county, and so forth. Um, so we, we, we know that pretty clearly that you, get, you can get a don't have money to afford it, you can, you can get a, a point of counsel if you're going to be charged with a crime which you can be sent to jail. What do we know about the right to counsel in civil cases? Uh, so what am, I, what am I talking about when I talk about civil? So it's, first of all, non-criminal. It doesn't involve uh, criminal. It could be child support, child custody, divorce, domestic violence, housing, eviction, uh, foreclosure cases, uh, health care, income, including Social Security and cash assistance for, for those that don't have income. Employment matters, consumer financial transactions, uh, discrimination, individual rights, there's a series of things that are not criminal, uh, and, but involve pretty important rights or pretty important needs, need for housing, need for health care, um, the need for, to be treated uh, without dis discrimination, uh, need to be treated fairly in, in commercial transactions, et cetera. Uh, so where do you think... Uh, any kind of rights come from for, for a person in a civil case uh, who doesn't have money to afford a lawyer. You have, to, you, have to, you have to think a little bit. So when we were going to elementary school, at least I had to, and I think I suspect others did, we had to recite something usually in the morning. What was that? <laughs> pledge of Allegiance, right? And so interestingly, uh, so remember Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, I'm going to read it to make sure I got it right. I, I should know it automatically, right? I think we sort of do know it automatically. That, I, I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. What's the end of it? Liberty and justice for all. Oh, thank you. you remember that. Liberty and justice for all. Okay. Uh, we have that. It's it, sort of a, um, uh, a value, an American value. We teach our kids it. We, we think the, the Pledge of Allegiance is very, very important to the founding of our country, etc. cetera. Um, so if you go to the Supreme Court uh, building in Washington, U.S. Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C., uh, the top part, there's uh, some wording up there. You know what it says? It says, it, it, uh, it's carved out of the marble. It, it says equal justice under law. So the top court in the country uh, uh, says equal justice under law. The Pledge of Allegiance says uh, um, the liberty and justice for all. Is there anything that says it in the Constitution for civil cases? No, there's not. I mean, there, there are arguments perhaps that can be made under equal protection, 
uh, uh, they have not been successful so far to establish a civil right to counsel where you don't have the ability to afford it. Uh, so it, it, it would seem like you know discrimination based on economic status should should be uh, should fit right within uh, um, uh, equal protection analysis, and it has been used in certain situations for the right to education, for example, has been used, but has not been used for establishing a right to counsel. And more importantly, who would fund that, right? Who would pay for the lawyers? Who would pay for your legal assistance? So um, so how do we enforce the Pledge of Allegiance? Gee, I mean, even you go into small claims court and say, I want to enforce the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I don't think I'd be very effective, right? Or how do you enforce the words above the, the, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, building in, in Washington, D.C.? It's really very difficult to enforce it. Uh, so, uh, so we're in a situation now where where people who can't afford a lawyer and uh, and aren't able to get a lawyer because of the limited. I'll talk about what kind of structures are in existence now to provide lawyers in civil cases for people that can't afford it. But we're in a situation now where there and have been for many many years uh, where uh, really fundamental needs, like I mentioned earlier, uh, need for housing. Need for health care, need for income, need to be treated without discrimination fairly, uh, need to be treated fairly in employment, uh, et cetera. But those needs are um, uh, often at peril or are, have been taken away from uh, some people that do not have the ability to have a lawyer. So that's, that's, that's a very, very difficult situation, as you can appreciate. Um, uh, so let's talk about the need for, for, for legal aid, the need to have a lawyer where you can't afford it. And my background has been civil legal aid. Uh, so uh, uh, for the last 45 years, I retired last year. For the last 45 years, uh, I've been a, a legal aid lawyer, executive director, former executive director of legal aid in Hawaii, Northern Virginia, and American Seminole. Uh, but uh, one of the, uh, the funding mechanisms for legal aid programs throughout the country uh, is the Federal Legal Services Corporation. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an independent agency that's actually a nonprofit created by Congress, like the post office, like Amtrak, with a separate board of directors appointed by uh, the president, uh, confirmed by the Senate, uh, and overseen by Congress, but we're not part of that. We, I say we, I used to work there. We're not part of the federal government, really, because uh, the reason was the legal aid lawyers sued the federal government sometimes. It didn't make sense for them to be under, under the executive branch where we might sue the labor department or we might sue the Social Security department. Or whatever the Social Security uh, Administration. Uh, so, the Legal Services Corporation has done a couple of, uh, in, the, in the midst of one right now, too, a couple of uh, legal needs surveys throughout the country, and they, they've contracted with the University of Chicago researchers. And the last one they have is 2017, so they're doing one this year, will be out by the end of the year 2022. Where they, where they uh, uh, the researchers at the University of Chicago, they, they surveyed 2,000 people. Which, the new ones we have 4,000 people. And uh, the most starking finding they had, stark finding they had was 86% of, of people with civil legal problems uh, the previous year uh, did not have access to an attorney or they didn't, didn't have adequate representation. 86%. The previous studies uh, have shown uh, 80%. Generally, 20% get addressed by legal aid or volunteer lawyers, pro bono lawyers, but 80% uh, don't get their needs met. There are a number of reasons for that. Some of it has to do with people not identifying a need as uh, having a legal remedy or that it's a legal problem. If you don't get health care, sometimes you don't think of it as a legal problem. I think of it as a health care problem or something. Or, uh, or they're simply, uh, you call legal aid and they say, we don't have enough lawyers to represent you because we don't have enough resources uh, or, uh, or there's nobody there to help you. 86%. Uh, uh, so those are really high figures. There's a couple of other things that came out of the study. Uh, that I just want to mention. So, uh, of the programs that Legal Services Corporation funds, um, about a million people in 2017 study, a million people the year before uh, went to legal aid but were unable to get full service, so unable to get service because legal aid is turned away uh, and because they didn't have the adequate resources. Uh, and 71% um, of legal of low income households had had a legal problem the previous year. And uh, and uh, seven in ten low-income Americans with recent uh, personal experience, excuse me, had recent personal experience with a civil legal program say the problem has significantly affected their lives. These are important fundamental needs, right? 
Uh, and so, uh, uh, and the availability resources is, is 85 percent of people. So that's the reason they can't get assistance really the unavailability of the resources. And um, this I would not have believed in, uh, uh, based on my my uh, knowledge in the past, but um, but they they found that uh, uh, for people with incomes of 100 percent of the federal poverty level uh, or below, there's uh, Four times greater uh, incidence of domestic violence than those with over 400 mm. percent. Uh, I've always taught, I've certainly seen, and, and uh, that, that domestic violence spreads out throughout all economic uh, uh, situations, mm. all areas of the country, all, all, all situations. This is actually saying that uh, they found that, that domestic violence was much more prevalent in the lower uh, group of 100 percent or lower. And uh, for each of the categories, they broke down domestic violence. Uh, uh, just people with disabilities, uh, uh, guardians of minor children, veterans, uh, rural services, around 85 to 87 percent of folks were able to get services, were able to get a lawyer for the legal problems. Uh, pretty stark. You know, 86 percent of people can't get lawyers. Um, so uh, what does the evidence show? So there's been a series, particularly in the last uh, 10 years, there's been a movement within the legal aid community uh, including law schools, including uh, uh, Obama lawyer groups, uh, and uh, to to uh, conduct evidence based studies. Um, I, mean, I think we generally know uh, that it's a good idea if you have a serious legal problem to get a lawyer, right? I think most of us would think that. Uh, we might think, God, how am I going to afford a lawyer? But it's generally thought to be a good idea. But this is an effort to say, well, when we look at things and we do certain studies where we uh, um, do randomized studies where you, you know it's a there's a control group and there's a group of folks that did have lawyers in the same situations and they uh, uh, adjusted for, for any variables but let's see what that shows so there's been a series i'm going to talk about three different areas um, one is the domestic violence uh, intimate partner violence areas there's a series of studies in that uh, another is housing primarily and eviction cases and the third one is uh, Social Security disability representation, Social Security disability issues. Uh, there are studies in other areas as well, but these, these are areas that are typically important civil legal needs that are unaddressed um, and that also frequently are, uh, to the extent they're able to, by uh, legal aid program lawyers or pro bono lawyers uh, uh, address these issues. Uh, so uh, the Center for Disease Control has found that uh, through their review of other studies that about 36% of all women in the United States uh, are subject to domestic violence uh, during their lifetime, 36%. So a third of all women, um, interestingly, 33% uh, of men have at least one incident of domestic violence during their lifetime. That's a higher figure than I've heard before. But that's what CDC is saying, because uh, I always thought it was completely lopsided. Uh, and certainly, you know, my experience in legal aid is that the you know, vast, nearly, 95% majority of our clients with, with domestic violence problems were, were women. But anyway, 36% of, of women during their lifetime were poor, uh, experienced domestic violence. So that's sort of uh, putting it into context. Uh, and uh, the research highlights uh, so uh, one study is that providing uh, civil counsel and divorce, custody, and, and uh, Protective order proceedings uh, can significantly improve outcomes for domestic violence. Okay, well, that makes sense. 83% uh, of victims represented by an attorney successfully obtained a protective order. You know, a protective order, you go into court and the judge orders the abuser to stay away from the, the woman, mostly, that would be uh, a, a, a beaten, uh, uh, mistreated um, uh, mentally, emotionally, or physically uh, by the abuser. Uh, and uh, so 83%. Uh, represented by an attorney, we're able to get that protection. It's a piece of paper, right? A piece of paper can't stop a bullet, uh, uh, but a piece of paper can't start the process of somebody else, judge, prosecutors, police, looking at this person, being aware of this person, uh, and having it so that uh, he can be arrested if necessary as well. <laughs> Those that didn't have a lawyer were going in to get a protective order, just 32%, so about a third, 32% versus, versus 83%. Uh, Gives you some indication of, of the, the, uh, the help that a lawyer can provide uh, a woman who's been, uh, who's been mistreated and beaten up. 
uh, when I was the director of legal aid in Northern Virginia, um, we, we did a handbook for domestic violence survivors. And uh, one time I, I met a person who said, you know, we love it. We handed out to different community groups, et cetera. Et cetera. One person said, uh, you know, we love that book. Uh, oh, where are you from? I said, well, we uh, were ambulance drivers. And uh, so when we show up in a, a family dispute or a domestic violence dispute, we can hand this to the woman and shows where she can contact for legal, not only legal help, but you know, a shelter help, other assistance, and so forth. And I never thought about that, but it, it was down to you know, where these people refer to immediately when you're right there with somebody bleeding or somebody who needed immediate assistance. Um, so, uh, in another study is uh, civil legal, legal services uh, can most directly address economic self sufficiency in two ways uh, of those that are. Uh, suffering from domestic violence, those survivors, by increasing income and decreasing economic liability. Uh, there's a series of other uh, legal problems that domestic violence survivors have. Uh, it could be housing, it could be consumer, it could be debt problems. And so we find that each, uh, uh, and the studies have found that each uh, domestic violence victim ends up having often these other legal problems that have to be addressed. They're not to, they may be related to, um, to uh, the domestic violence, but um, they, they are related, I should say. They are related to domestic violence, but it's not necessarily the representation of the court to get a protective order that's solved. It's got to be a different proceeding to, to resolve those other issues. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and one study said that the uh, overwhelming uh, group of participants in the study uh, uh, did not obtain uh, a divorce. Many people want a divorce after this, uh, not everybody, uh, unless they have lawyers. So they get stuck. Our, our legal system is pretty complicated in the US, right? And for those of you who have been through it and you get stuck, I've, I've, I've represented people that have tried to do things themselves and it, it's like uh, you're stuck in the spider web or something. It's hard to know which way to go. The judges want to be impartial. They often feel he or she as a judge cannot bend over backwards to try to help one party because they think, well, I gotta help the other party. And there's some uh, raging debate in the judicial community about that as to, as to their obligation to make sure that the record is fully, uh, fully developed with the facts and that, that the law is applied appropriately. But in any event, it makes it difficult for the judges to feel like they have to help or they, they can help one party that's not represented. Uh, most services, this is a really interesting study. It was from 2003, but uh, most services provided to help uh, Battered women do not impact the likelihood of abuse, future likelihood of abuse. But the provision of legal services significantly lowers the incident of future domestic violence. Why do you think that's so? Why do you think a piece of paper can do that? Well, it's really involving other people in the community. It's involving the prosecutors, as I mentioned. It's involving police. It's involving the judges. And the judges can have sanctions or penalties, uh, but put an abuser in jail as well for violating the orders. So that the, that the abuser knows there's somebody else watching his uh, uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, it doesn't always work. And there's been a number of cases where there's existing restraining orders and the woman is okay killed by the abuser. So, uh, so it doesn't protect everything, but it does help. Um, and that, that was a fascinating study. Um, but that's actually the, the, the most significant factor to decrease future domestic violence was to be uh, obtaining a lawyer to help women in that situation. Um, and then uh, 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 another study out of Washington State, 2015, said that uh, uh, the, uh, with a, those with a legal aid lawyer had 75% more uh, parental visitation and almost 50% uh, more likely to require the abuser to have treatment and that they would get, they would become the, uh, the, uh, the uh, battered woman would become uh, the sole caretaker of the child, the primary decision maker of the child. Uh, over 50% of the time. So having a lawyer protects those uh, rights that are connected with, or can be connected with uh, uh, a protective order. Generally, it's a separate proceeding or it could be added to an existing proceeding for uh, for child support, for custody. Um, and we all know that, that it's an economic disaster to have uh, separation of parties and splitting or uh, combining their income. So the pretty stark uh, figures on domestic violence and the success of uh, of those that can't afford a lawyer getting a lawyer versus not you know, having a lawyer or trying to represent themselves. 
Let's look at the housing, uh, the second one. Um, and and there's a there's a uh, I'll talk about it in a minute. There's a, there is a civil right to counsel movement that's, that's uh, hopefully spreading across the United States. But but, um, but there's a, there's an organization called the National uh, uh, Right to Civil Counsel that's compiled uh, uh, data. And in um, in evictions, we I think become much more familiar during COVID about how many more people are on the line of being evicted or not, and losing the income variety. Of situations where they're not able to pay rent. Uh, but in a survey they did throughout the country, uh, 3% of tenants in eviction have lawyers. 3%, that's one, two, three, three percent. And uh, and how many uh, landlords do you think? Uh, what percentage of landlords are represented? Anybody want to guess? 97. 97? <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, and I, I've heard over 90, I've heard 99. This study had 80%. When they went around the country, it was, there was, yeah, one, one study talking about New York being 99%. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so 80% versus 3%. And uh, it's, not a, it's not a good situation, right? And, uh, and there's, there's a very high rate of, of no shows for people who are getting uh, uh, sometimes over 50 up to 79% of people that are receiving addiction levels. They, uh, they don't know what to do sometimes. It's often for, uh, for not being able to pay rent, not always, but often not being able to pay rent, they don't think they can do much. But the group of Harvard researchers, researchers in 2012 um, found that uh, two thirds of those uh, that had lawyers were able to stay in their homes in eviction proceedings, while one third without a lawyer were able to stay in their homes. So a significant difference. Um, so, as I'll mention in a minute, the, the civil rights to counsel movement is, is spreading a little bit uh, across the country. There's uh, three states now that have limited civil right to counsel or funded it for certain situations. Uh, representation and eviction proceedings generally fits within that. Uh, and uh, and there, there are 13 uh, cities. So some of the preliminary uh, uh, information is coming back on the success of that. And uh, fascinating, in New York City, 86% of represented tenants were able to stay in the homes, 86 percent. Uh, and in San Francisco, 67 percent, in Cleveland, 97 percent, uh, 97 percent figure, uh, were able to stay in their homes with, with a lawyer. Uh, I suspect these figures are a little high, uh, probably because of the, of the COVID money that came in to help tenants who didn't have uh, ability to pay rent and that you could get money from the government to help pay rent and that, that resulted in them being able to stay in their homes or their apartments. So I think it's a little bit higher than maybe it'll show, but still it shows pretty uh, promising efforts and cities are very interested. I mean, there's a National Legal Cities uh, uh, website has a whole provision about what, what cities can do to help cut down the, uh, the rate of uh, evictions because they realize such an economic uh, impact it has on the community, right? That, may end up in homelessness, may end up in more mental health service, may end up in more uh, uh, other provisions, other uh, obligations the city has to people. Uh, okay, so, so we know that with, uh, uh, with uh, tenancies, uh, tenants and facing eviction, having a lawyer is substantially advantageous than not having a lawyer. What about social security? A lot of uh, so, uh, legal aid programs and, uh, and uh, Pro bono lawyers help with uh, uh, people trying to get disability benefits in the Social Security Administration, whether it's uh, Social Security disability or supplemental security income. And uh, in 2017, uh, a study by the GAO, General Accountability Office, uh, revealed that people who hired an attorney to help with their disability claims in Social Security, people who had an attorney who hired them, were three times more successful than those that didn't have attorneys. Uh, wow. Just those three areas, domestic violence, housing, and social security. We, we have overwhelming evidence that uh, having an attorney is beneficial. I think we sort of know that, don't we? we know that, but uh, we, we have evidence uh, um, in uh, uh, evidence-based studies uh, that, that that is true as well. Um, so what's happening in the U.S.? Um, make sure I'm not taking too long here. Uh, What's happening in the U.S.? So federal funding is the Legal Services Corporation I mentioned before, uh, where we used to work with. So they're funding, this year they're funding uh, $489 million. It goes to 132 different independent legal aid programs. Hawaii has one. They're all nonprofits. 
they're either uh, organized by city, county, or state. Uh, and uh, it becomes um, uh, that 200, uh, uh, excuse me, 489 million. Guess, guess what the funding was for legal services by Congress in 1980? 300 million. If you adjusted for inflation on a 300 million figure, the current appropriation should be uh, over 900 million. We're about half about half of what we should be just with inflation. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that. A lot of it had to do with uh, former Governor Ronald Reagan in California, who did not like legal aid lawyers representing fraud workers in the fields. And, uh, and his supporters were coming uh, from the farmers, the larger farmers. And so when he went to the presidency, he tried an effort to eliminate legal service corporations. So it became controversial for a number of years under the Reagan administration. And it's, it's just the last few years come out of that type of controversy, but not the funding so much. This year there's a 5% increase, but 5% um, increase is going to, it's not going to be enough to really address the need. Uh, so uh, legal aid programs uh, receive funds um, from legal service corporations, about 36% of their money, and they get the rest from other sources, states, uh, uh, foundations, donations, other federal programs. Uh, there's, there's almost 4 million people in the United States who are eligible for legal service corporation. So that's 125% of the federal poverty level. So pretty poor. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big, big group of people. Um, and um, so 71.7% of all cases with legal aid programs funded, the 132 legal aid programs funded by, uh, by legal service corporations, 71%, that's seven, actually 72%. You think they're men, women, or what? They're women. Okay. Women. So nearly three quarters of all clients that we delayed has throughout the country. Uh -huh. um, and interestingly, 75% of all we delayed employees were women as well. Uh, it used to be that they would primarily be legal secretaries, some paralegals. Now they dominate staff attorney positions. Uh, managing attorney positions and are making uh, significant efforts in the, the top leadership position. I'm sure whether they're over the 50% for uh, CEO positions yet or not, but they're making significant strides. Um, so uh, what type of cases does the legal services fund uh, or what are the programs they fund, what, what type of cases they do? Uh, so 31% family law. That includes domestic violence, that includes child support, child custody, um, Divorce, 30% uh, almost the same amount of housing. Uh, that includes uh, the whole uh, foreclosure crisis cases, and, uh, uh, loss of tenancy with evictions. 11% income maintenance, that would be Social Security, cash assistance, 8% uh, consumer finance, 5% uh, individual rights, 3% health, 3% employment, 6% uh, education, or some miscellaneous. Uh, so those are the generally the civil cases. Uh, and, uh, and, and I mentioned earlier the state funding. Uh, so Hawaii has uh, some state funding for legal aid, for example. Uh, and it uh, comes from grant aid sometimes, a legal aid program. Um, there are filing fees, civil filing fees in court. A portion of those go to legal aid programs. It's funneled through the Hawaii Justice Foundation for other uh, legal aid programs as well. So uh, and then there's donations. Uh, there's something called interest on lawyer trust fund, which is lawyers buying their clients' monies for short-term purposes. Banks have historically not paid any interest because they couldn't figure out which client to give it to. It's all cool. And legal aid programs throughout the country over the last uh, 25 years have been able to uh, uh, buy rule requirement or banks agreeing to do it have, uh, have got uh, uh, banks to agree to or required to pay comparable interest rates in the money for the legal aid program. Or there's some creative uh, funding uh, efforts as well. Uh, Texas has uh, something called the poll tax. Uh, and uh, it's, it, you know, when someone told me about it, I was trying to figure out what's a poll tax. Well, you know, women that dance on polls. Uh, and uh, so they, they decided that they would uh, use a certain portion of a tax on that, and they would tie it to domestic violence. So it was interesting, I haven't heard of that being in any other place, but people are generally trying to get money in any other, any other nonprofits. They're looking for 
for money anywhere they come. And so, um, uh, so the, the legislature liked the fact that it was tied to the cigar, so that's why they passed it. Uh, and there's some other, there's some other uh, federal monies uh, uh, for domestic violence that some programs receive. Hawaii gets it, but we receive it in America as well. Another trend is access to justice commissions, which are groups of, 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 of lawyers, judges, members of the legislature, various by state. 40 states have it now. Uh, uh, legal aid programs, uh, uh, volunteer lawyers. Uh, and, uh, and they get together and they look at how can we expand access for those that can't afford civil legal aid, can't afford awards for in civil cases. And uh, I was active in helping form the Hawaii Commission, uh, and uh, it's, it's active now. And, and, uh, Former Chief Justice Moon is very supportive, and, and now Chief Justice Mark Rechtenwald is extremely supportive of, of, of the Access to Justice Commission. Uh, and um, uh, pro bono lawyers, uh, so that's another uh, uh, increased trend. Uh, in the 2017 study by the American Bar Association, uh, of 47,000 lawyers uh, surveyed, 81% uh, said they did pro bono uh, cases at some point in the career. And 52% uh, said they'd done previous, uh, the previous year pro bono or free cases, averaging about 36 hours a year. Uh, the American Bar Association has a standard that they encourage, not mandatory. There's a group of people that want it mandatory, but they encourage lawyers to volunteer 50 hours a year uh, of free service for people that can't afford people or groups that can't afford it. Uh, and another movement is expand work. Uh, where legal aid services are provided. Uh, it could be in the courthouse or courthouse self-help centers uh, in Hawaii. Uh, there's, there's two here. There's one, there's one in Hilo, there's one um, in Kona. Uh, there's uh, Maui has uh, Hawaii Maui, uh, two on Oahu, where lawyers, uh, volunteer lawyers or legal aid lawyers are present in the court uh, house so they can provide instant assistance to people that are there in court. Uh, or uh, there's also this medical legal partnership movement that's uh, you know, particularly in larger hospitals where you have lawyers that are stationed at the hospitals so that those people that need legal aid can have direct uh, access to legal aid. Uh, one uh, often cited the uh, reason for that is, for example, that a family kept coming into this one hospital with the, the children had lead poisons. Turned out that lead poisoning was caused by the pain in their house. So it really needed a legal remedy. They had to go out to the landlord. There, there had to be a change in the living conditions so that the kids would keep coming back for lead poisoning. Um, and the civil council, right to council, as I mentioned earlier, three states, 13 cities have now, and, and those, those figures are, uh, you know, 86% 80, of New York City, 67% of San Francisco and Cleveland, uh, 90, 93% uh, 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 with lawyers are able to be successful in fighting evictions or solving it. So we laid it away as, as a, uh, uh, Officer on all the islands, or offices throughout all the islands, 10 different offices. And um, in order to qualify for legal aid, for one person, it's 18,000 a year. For family of four, it's uh, 38,000 a year. They receive a total of about $7.2 million. Uh, 1.6 of that comes to the Federal uh, Legal Services Corporation. 64% uh, of their clients uh, are women. Uh, I, I suspect that's uh, a little lower than national average because they represent a number of juveniles as well. Um, and uh, uh, and their, their cases are similar, 20, 27% of family, 17% of housing, 17 and half percent income maintenance. Well, mostly those are social security cases. Uh, mentioned court, uh, self-help center, et cetera. So I'm gonna uh, conclude with just a, a statement and then open it up for questions or comments. Uh, hopefully I haven't taken too long in that um, and uh, um, one is, is um, okay, given the fact that we, as I mentioned earlier, there are 86% of, of um, low income residents who had a legal problem uh, the previous year uh, can't get a lawyer or having that to representation, 86%. And given the fact that the evidence based studies in the areas that I mentioned, the domestic violence, housing, and social security over the years, um, you know, show that. Uh, uh, for for uh, for uh, for, uh, for protective order, I mentioned eighty three percent of those uh, with lawyers can get a protective order, as opposed to thirty two percent. They provision of legal services significantly lowers the incidence of domestic violence and evictions. Two thirds of tenants 
can save their homes, whereas one third with a lawyer, one third cannot. And then we know that uh, three times in social security uh, disability cases, uh, SSI cases in front of social security, the majority is more likely to be successful with a lawyer or not. Uh, we know that people who, who have the ability to hire lawyers can protect their rights. Uh, and and uh, it's quite clear that there's equal justice only for some in America. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think that's controversial, really. Uh, it's, it's, it's not for all. We have, a, we have a, a goal. We have a Pledge of Allegiance. We have on the, on the front of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, but we don't, we have not lived up to our value, our, value, our goal. At all. And um, um, so it's, it's, it's fundamental that we have equal justice for all in civil cases. Uh, as stated as an American value, but it's an unrecognized yet American value. We must and can be better. And um, and if not, access to justice for, will uh, be unrealized. And to make justice real for people that can't afford it, we, we have to be better, both in funding and mechanisms that deliver those services. So thank you. And I, I'd like to open it up for questions or comments. Yes. Uh, my name is Kill Downing. And, uh... I, I worked sometimes as an interpreter, and most Marshallese women never actually get the money in their hands. And so when uh, occasionally it would come up for a TRO, they were told they would have to pay to have the complainant, you know, uh, served, which was a, quite a bit of money and hard to find people who would serve. Is that being addressed at all? Uh Let's see, it's been some years since I was a director of Legal Aid Hawaii, I left in 2009. Uh, at that point, we, if, if a client had the ability to pay for the cost of service, we would. If the client did not, we would use uh, our other funding to pay for that. I can't comment on what's currently being done on that issue. But, but yeah, you can't, you've got to eliminate those barriers, right? And if that becomes a barrier, you've got to figure out a way to remove it. Uh, so there's both the cost of service and, and court filing fees. You don't want people who can't afford to pay court filing fees, but there's an ability to waive those court filing fees and uh, it, it uh, uh, works out to the knowledge of the legal aid client to get it waived by the judge. Nancy Blunder had a question, I think. Yes, um, I'm in a situation where I, um, I'm online here. If you're looking for me, I'm up in the ether. <laughs> um, I, uh, wrote a, a letter uh, in um, protest of our road maintenance corporation election, which had 31 flaws um, of not following bylaws, state statutes, you name it. Um, they took me to court and they won, um, claiming that my letter was a derivative action. Um, the court would not allow me uh, to finish discovery, which included election documents, claiming that I didn't have a lawyer and that was their reason. Um, so I'm a bit puzzled as to what resources are available to someone because the, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a domestic violence um, situation. I'm not a housing situation. I'm not a, dis a disability situation. I'm in a situation where they have changed their bylaws and created a huge debt for me. Um, you know, I plan to appeal, but to find a lawyer to take the appeal when you don't have any income is next to impossible. And moreover, the same judge that went with this with dirty hands, um, the road maintenance corporation had unclean hands. The judge violated my rights under color of law he has the power to refuse to um, appeal the appeal of the case. So what do you do? Any recommendations? Yeah, that would, it's the Homeowners Association or something like that? Um, it is a road maintenance corporation. But yeah, that's typically a case that legal aid would not handle, uh, but a pro bono lawyer uh, might handle it. Uh, there's an organization in Hawaii called uh, Voluntary Legal Services Hawaii that coordinates pro bono or free lawyers. Uh, I, would, I would contact them. Um, and uh, also the, the State Bar Association would be another uh, effort. But they probably, bar would probably refer you to uh, Voluntary Legal Services Hawaii 
or legal aid, but I suspect if you call legal aid, they, were, they won't have that case. So maybe you can get a pro bono lawyer through uh, through voluntary legal services in Hawaii. I would say that's your that would be my first suggestion for you. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any more questions? Questions? Somebody was asking on the screen in the chat. Um, there was a chat question, I think, from someone, but I don't remember who it was. Can you look in the chat and see? Bobley has a question and it is, is there one case that was especially memorable? Thank you, Chuck Greenfield. Oh boy, oh sure. Uh, there have been a number of cases that are memorable. Uh, one I remember uh, when I was uh, working as a lawyer in San Jose Legal Aid in San Jose, California. And uh, my client was, uh, was in his 30s, early 40s, and he had contracted polio. Uh, and um, he was uh, uh, quadriplegic and ventilator dependent. He was stuck in the hospital. The case came to us from a social worker, a medical social worker, said we can't get him out of the hospital because uh, the state will not approve home health care, home health nursing care for him. The doctor said he's perfectly fine to have home health nursing care, but the state would not do that. Uh, and uh, even though the state had told the federal government um, that uh, their home nursing care program was a way to save money um, and that they would be doing it. Uh, so I filed a lawsuit against that. We were able to get him uh, home. Uh, so where he, he was able to live independently with, with nursing care on a regular basis in his house rather than being in the hospital. And the doctors, uh, one doctor in particular, the social worker, they were all fantastic. We went up to Sacramento to do the case. And uh, yeah, I remember that. I remember uh, the, the, how happy I was along with him and the whole team to, uh, to see him being able to, uh, to go home with the appropriate nursing care. Uh, Dr. Oliver, you have a question. Um, does the state of Hawaii fund any legal aid? Do they have it in their budget? Uh, they, they did it when I was there. I don't know exactly if they do right now. It would probably come under grant and aid, which is some years yes, some years no. Uh, grants and aid, GIA. Uh, and uh, we tried to get, when I was the, uh, the director, we tried to get it in through, um, through judiciary, be part of judiciary. Some states have it that way. Uh, boy, Chief Justice Moon did not like that at all. <laughs> he did not like that. Uh, but because he thought it would decrease the judiciary budget uh, because they would just offset it. Uh, and um, and they do have things like food stamp outreach money. Sometimes it gets funneled through the state and the state makes a decision. The state, yes, the state does give money. Uh, this is probably the biggest source of money for uh, two areas. The judiciary gives money for representation of, of uh, children in, um, in abuse and neglect situations. Uh, could be representation of parent, could be representation of child. And so those are contracts for the state. Uh, and there's, uh, uh, let's see, there's another source of, uh, oh, to fund uh, lawyers to, and paralegals to represent uh, people in social security disability cases. Um, and the reason is because many people are receiving uh, state uh, cash assistance program, general assistance, and they can get more money uh, if they move on to the supplemental security income based on the stories as a stock with them, um, Social Security, and then it saves the state money. So it's a, it's a, it's a uh, benefit to everybody involved, benefit to the person, of course, if they get a better living arrangement, living uh, income, and it's better for the state because they save money. So, so those are contracts, um, but we're not part of, I don't think, uh, part of a general appropriation line item. Uh, unless it's changed the last couple of years. So I have to double check and see whether that's changed. Okay, one more question perhaps, give them the time. If not, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. We have a tremendous amount of expertise about being an attorney. And I really appreciate your sharing that with us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.